Hi there, and welcome to today's webinar, The Truth About Carbon and Cast Iron, hosted by Spectro Analytical Instruments and Modern Casting Magazine. I'm Shannon Wetzel, Managing Editor for Modern Casting, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Today's speaker is Dan Soysen, Field Project Manager at Spectro. He has been a member of the Spectro Metal Analyzer team since 1987. His three decades of experience offer a blend of field application knowledge and technical instrument insight. While today is about hearing from the experts in the field, we also want to hear from all of you in the form of questions. To ask a question, look to the right side of your screen and locate the GoToWebinar control panel. On it, you'll see a section called Questions. Click on the plus sign and then just type in your question in the available space. I encourage you to submit questions at any time during the webinar and we'll be responding to as many of them as we can during the Q&A session after the presentation. What we can't answer on air, we'll do our best to answer as quickly as possible over the next few days. Also, please note a recording of today's webinar will be sent to you as a link in an email by the beginning of next week so that you can view or share today's event as an on-demand viewing. So without further ado, Dan, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Spectra today for a webinar on carbon and cast iron. We will be discussing our FB25 method for improved determination of carbon, specifically in ductile iron. I'm Dan Soysen and the field product manager for Spark OES in the NAFTA region. I've been with Spectra for nearly 30 years, as you just heard. I've seen quite a few changes in our market over the last three decades. This, this relatively new and advanced method is pretty exciting, and I'm glad I get to discuss it with you today. So on the agenda, we'll be discussing general information, sample taking and related effects, the definition of the analytical problem, inclusion, size, count versus determination error, pre-burn period and related effects, development basics, result comparison, and conclusions and benefits. So carbon, as you all probably know, carbon is the most important element in cast iron. It therefore has to be monitored constantly during the melting process as part of the chemical composition of the melt. Sample taking is critical. Chilling too slow produces graphite inclusions. However, it is well known that spark emission spectrometers need completely graphite-free samples to produce accurate results. Completely graphite-free samples are also known as white samples. In real life, it takes a lot of experience and perfect sample taking procedure to achieve this white structure on a regular basis. In other words, it's very difficult and we have to accept partly gray samples. This is the reason to develop a new carbon determination method. So sample molds are going to be very important. On the left picture here, you see a solid copper block copper mold. This one's made specifically for cast iron. It can be bought on the open market. Uh, it does not use water cooled. It's just a big basic heat sink that chills the sample surface very quickly. The one on the left is another big copper mold that is poured into, but this one has the ability to be water cooled. Now, of course, you know, having water in a melting area could be a problem. So that's, that's your options out there that you can look at for sample molds. So a little more on the sample taking method. We have to be, when taking sampling, be careful not to introduce slag into the component. When casting into a cold copper mold, there can be no cast scans from the previous sampling. And the volume of the mold and the thickness of the sample have to be matched to each other. Just briefly on the cleaning of those cast scans, you have to make sure that in between each sample, the best method is to clean that mold. So let's start with the laminar cast iron. Samples with partial gray, carbon determined too high, and the extension of the pre-burn time on this can solve that problem. Laminar cast iron represents approximately 60% of the total cast iron production. If the sample consists of free graphite, it is possible in most cases to remelt the area into a white structure. The sample stays in one position on the spark stand. 
The concentration of carbon drops from a very high value, approximately 6%, after each preborn cycle, while the differences decrease until it stabilizes. Two or three results with good repeatability show the correct carbon result. So on this gray iron here, a good way if you have too much free graphite in it is to just spark it in the same spot so you see that everything stabilizes and you can take that result. The other thing is if there's a magnesium or cerium or a real high carbon level, it will give you a flag because we're not expecting that in the laminar. The magnesium and cerium is into the globular, so we won't see that here. If you if it recognizes that, it will tell you there's a warning and that this is not to be used. So globular cast iron samples partial gray. The carbon is determined to be too low. That's what we typically see. Extremely slow chilling free graphite inclusions might lead to super elevate carbon values. Globular cast iron covers approximately 30% of the total cast iron production. 45 to 50 percent of that is by the automotive industry that has extremely high quality requirements. 20 percent is used for special containments with thick walls, and 30 percent covers the tube industry. So the carbon results are related to the process control. Let's take a look at some of the, the size class of the ducto iron. And in this slide, we're looking at a size class 6 with the average size of the, the nodule at 45 micron. And when we analyze with the Spark OES, we're getting about a 3.07% carbon. On a combustion, the true value, you're getting a 3.63. And there's quite a difference, and it is very low compared to what the true value is. Now, if you look at this slide, on the right, you have a size class 7, which the, the average size of the carbon is 22.5 micron. But if you look how the carbon now is at 3.46 on a spark OES and a 3.65, it's, it's still low, but it's much closer. So we could determine, if you look back here at the size 6, where the carbon was 3.07, compared to the combustion of 3.63, that there is some correlation between the size of the, the free graphite and the nodules in there. So subsequently, what you, what you see here on the left is a completely white sample. And if you look at the iron results, the iron reference line, it's very stable. There's no, no big spikes. And then on the carbon line, it's also very stable. There's no free graphite. But if you pop across here and take a look at the, the carbon line here, at the very beginning of the, the initial period, stabilization period, you see high carbon activity, the packets of high carbon results at the very beginning of the preburn. Yet the iron reference line is still, still very stable. So what's happening? What we've discovered, if you look under a microscope, you see this is a pre-burn spot. If you look around it, you see that there's nice smooth areas where the nodules have, are basically gone. So we took it and we were trying to determine how we can find that eliminated graphite. I have this video, and what we have here is a partially gray sample we are about to analyze. Now if you look at the pre-burn picture as the one I was just showing, you'll notice in the red shaded areas that there are free carbon spots that have evaporated during the excitation period. As you see here, during the initial part of the pre-spark, we have a big spike of carbon activity. Unfortunately, with conventional OES, it is not possible to measure these carbon packets as it is happening during the pre-spark. Therefore, when a partially gray sample is measured, the carbon content can deviate greatly from what is determined using combustion analysis. So in summary, the analysis, there's no conclusion of the quality of the sample can be made, and an incorrect result for carbon can be presented without warning. Now the near-perfect way to solve this issue at hand is the advantage. 
Spectra's advanced method includes the pre-spark time for analysis of the carbon. This also provides evidence as to the quality of the sample itself. Let's have a look at the extended measuring range. By including the pre-spark time in the analysis with the new spectro method, the correct carbon content is calculated. Additional information as to the quality of the sample is displayed. Analysis correction with the spectro OES. Free graphite component is analyzed during the pre-spark time. Analysis correction, is, if possible, is done. The results are now comparable to that found with the combustion analysis. Of course, if the deviation in the carbon content is too large, the result is marked and unusable. This is expected. This method is not completely to replace the combustion method, but it's expected to eliminate a large portion of the combustion analysis at work. So, after recognizing the analytical problem of that carbon disappearing, the next step was to end identification of the intensity level of carbon in the pre-burn sequence. All of the known wavelengths like carbon-165 and carbon-193 nanometers are too sensitive and showed, couldn't show the expected overflow of intensities. Only the new carbon-148 nanometers was capable to cover these extreme intensity levels. The stabilizing ratio calculation is done with the new reference line, Fe149 nanometers. Both lines are very close together, showing a perfect fit. Both lines are in a range between 120 and 160 nanometers. That has been discovered by spectra when we change from vacuum technique to gas filling. For those who are not familiar with OES, oxygen in the atmosphere is it absorbing the light. To decrease this negative impact, Vacuum was used to open the range between 230 and 160 nanometers for important elements such as carbon, phos, sulfur, and boron. But in the late 80s, gas field was tested. We evacuated the chamber and filled it with nitrogen. This reduced again the existing oxygen particles, and we opened up the range all the way down to 120 nanometers. And here we did some investigation. This is where we found the 148 line, carbon line, that is not so sensitive that we can now look at the high impact of the carbon intensities during a pre-burn. So they extended wavelength range down to 120 meters in combination with the CCD technology created new analytical opportunities. One thing was low carbon and nitrogen analysis in the single part per million range with the carbon 133 nanometer line and the nitrogen 149 nanometer in the first optical order. Other benefits came as we're searching down in that wavelength range that we could see an oxygen line at 130 nanometers and way down there at 121 nanometers, uh, we could detect that, and this is very important in titanium-based alloys. So result comparisons after taking these high carbon intensities during the pre-burn that we were previously losing and now adding it back into the analysis, we're able to get our comparisons much closer. If you look at some of the slowly chilled and very slowly chilled, where we had a 3.54 and a slowly chilled one, and adding it back in, we we're able to get up at a 3.63, while the combustion was at 3.62. On the very slowly chilled, where the graphite was higher, we we're way down at the 3.19, but by seeing this carbon, the graphite disappearing during a pre-spark, we're able to get up to 3.64, which again is very close to the combustion. And again, you see here 3.58 up to the 3.66, 3.29 up to the 3.62, very comparable to the combustion analysis. And the one more down here, the 3.52 all the way up to 3.69, 3.15 to 3.68. The comparisons are much better now that we were able to eliminate a lot of that combustion work as long as the sample wasn't too bad. So conclusion, it's possible to determine if there's any free graphite in a real life and real time samples. 
a warning occurs as soon as the sample contains a critical level of graphite or if it was too slowly chilled or as cast. Carbon determination errors included by graphite are reduced. Differences to combustion methods typically less than 0.1 percent. Again, this method is not designed to analyze carbon in manufactured articles such as the ASCAST. So if you have a piece of casting that comes in, you cut it, grind it, try to get carbon, you're never going to get it. The analytical result of carbon is correct and very reliable. If no result is possible, the operator can take direct action. It's possible to reduce the number of combustion analysis drastically using this expensive equipment only for control purposes. As the combustion equipment, as you know, has consumables and man hours, everything weighing up samples and getting it taken care of. If we can eliminate some of that, we've accomplished what we've been trying to do. The new method gives a clear indication about the quality of the sample preparation. So pouring samples into the copper molds, cleaning in between, it's actually watching to see how well that's actually done. All this together proves that the FE25 can save money. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Dan. And uh, again, a reminder to everyone that the recording of the webinar will be emailed to you all um, early next week. And if you do have a question, go ahead and uh, type it into the question section in your control panel to the right. All right, Dan, we have a first question uh, in now. It's how long has this method been around? Well, that's a good question because it's been around for a couple years now, but it, it just doesn't seem to be out in the market and everybody realizes what we're able to do here. So it's really been around for just a little over two years. A lot of Cast iron companies already have this program on their instrument. I'm not sure at this moment who's all using it. I do have a couple clients that do, but it's not brand new. We've had it for a couple years. Okay, and another one is, is this a unique method to Spectros technology? Yes, this is a unique method to us. We were able to discover it with our proprietary UV optic that has the ability where we started looking down in the lower ranges, down to the 120 nanometer, and as we found that 148 carbon line that was not sensitive, that would the other lines would saturate. You couldn't look at those high intensities of carbon during the pre-burn. With this 148 and the, the iron reference line 149 right next to it that complements it in the ratios, we're able to now just spectro this is unique to us to able to get the carbon during the pre-burn time to add that back in for the, the cast iron analysis. Very good. Another one asks, does this extend the total burn time? We, no, it doesn't. Uh, in the presentation, if you go back, you can see that the burn time is the same. We're just able now to utilize that after the initial stabilization of the pre-spark where you see the high carbon spikes, high carbon packets of intensities, we're just able to utilize the same pre-spark time and go from there. So the pre-burn time and the total spark time has not changed. Great, and we'll do one last question and then um, if there's any others, we'll follow up later this week. But uh, Dan, can someone ask, can we get carbon on ASCAS material? No, and I, I believe I did touch on that in the presentation. The ASCAS we cannot do. It's chilled too slowly. The carbon are too high. We'll never be able to spark it in the same spot enough times. We could get the other elements a lot of times very good, but the, the carbon we'll never have a chance to get. 